Welcome to the first Sky Cricket podcast of 2024. Happy New Year to you all. We've got a brand new podcast studio for our offerings this year, which may or may not improve things, given that we've got the same old tired faces in here. Happy New Year to you, Nas. Did you bring in the new year with your usual customary good cheer and optimism? You know I'm miserable, <laughs> whatever the year is. I actually made New Year's Eve for the first time for about 15 years although Dover Beach Barbados was more of an attraction <laughs> than anything else. So I made it with the kids. They were absolutely thrilled to see me out at midnight. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Did you make it to, to New Year's Eve? No. Uh, no, I made it to about 11 o'clock at night. Have you got any New Year's resolutions for us this year? Not particularly. I've decided to join a gym. I've gone and I'm going to pump some weights. All this baseball stuff. I've decided that the reason I wasn't baseball like was purely because I didn't have any muscle. So I'm going to build some muscle and give it a go. So um, what about you? Uh, two New Year's resolutions. I want to catch more salmon than I did last year. Okay, good luck one, with that. And read one good book a month, but we'll leave those to one side. Um, lots happened since our last end of year review for 23 in international cricket. So Pakistan in Australia, obviously they went down there. They need some new slip fielders as far as I can <laughs> see. Um, South Africa, an extraordinary series uh, against India, which we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about. And India's women who seem dominant in test matches, but less so in white ball cricket. I think their final T20 is happening against Australia as we speak, actually. From your uh, beach bar in, on Accra Beach, <laughs> sipping on a rum punch, what do you make of it all? A variety of conditions, definitely not just around the world, but in within a series, to be honest, from first test in South Africa to the second test and in India bowling out South Africa for 55 on that, um, on that first innings. And also... Uh, so many stories. Uh, you know, I know you, you write a lot, but there's been some great stories, whether it be Pakistan in Australia, whether it be pitches and conditions, Warner retiring, Elgar retiring. You couldn't have two more polar opposite types of cricketers. And then obviously the other big story that's broken with New uh, South Africa <coughs> virtually deciding to send their third team out to New Zealand because of SA20 starting this week and keeping some of their big names for that. So there's been a lot of stories, a lot to write about, and a lot of good cricket in I, a variety of conditions. That term, test match in Newlands was extraordinary. Actually, I saw a tweet where somebody said that the, the, the whole game lasted as long as Gary Kirsten's innings yeah. against us in 1999. Now, they say that's a short test match. Gary Kirsten's innings seemed interminable to me uh, lucky at the we time. Had, lucky we had Mark Butcher, otherwise he'd still be... <laughs> Butch got him out in the end. And um, I want to bring in our guest at this at this point because looking at the the figures for the spinners in that Test match, who were Jadeja and Maharaj, no overs, no maidens, none for none. Swanee, great to see you. Did did you ever play in a Test match where you didn't bowl an over? Um, I I played in a couple where I had to talk myself on in the second innings. Do you remember the Pakistan series? I think it's 2012 or 2011. The first innings at Edgbaston that was being rebuilt. We were in a horrific change room on the other side that's now a, a, a spare kitchen or something. <laughs> and Brody bowled them out and Jimmy bowled them out for next to nothing. The first test at Trent Bridge, I'd only bowled about three overs because Jimmy had got 15 wickets. And I had to bri literally bribe myself onto Strauss and say, look, I'll do anything. Just get me a bowl here because I could see my career going up in smoke if these two carried on taking so many wickets. I might as well have brought Nasser Hussain back as captain. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, how much of a thrill on. is it for you to be sat here uh, with Nas for the next 30 minutes, given he was your first England captain? You must have wrote such a shocking uh, report from South Africa in 1999. You didn't play for England again for 10 years. Yeah, I, I think a trained monkey who bowled Austin would have been selected ahead of me after <laughs> NASA's report. I never got to see that, you know. It was redacted. It was like government files that have been locked away for 30 years. <laughs> Hopefully I will see it one day. Um, but what I will say, NASA was the, the jolly, friendly face that we see before us these days, uh, back then. He was, he was something from a comic. He was like a Victorian villain um, who happened to be England captain at the time. So that was a treat for me as a young, um, cocky and very... Um, very happy-go-lucky 19-year-old. Nas did his best to bash that out of me, but it didn't succeed. I only had eight years in the wilderness watching everybody who, yeah. who'd even tried to bowl off and get a test match ahead of me. But I thank him, to be honest, because had I played in those eight years, I'd have had to bowl against Brian Lara, getting 400, 
<laughs> against some of the best players in the world. And I, I, I didn't actually play test cricket till most of the best players had retired. So um, he actually did me a favour. Um, we should Here explain we why you're joining us remotely. You're in Ahmedabad, which is a perfect place to to start dry, dry January. You're with the Lions team um, for the next, what, five or six weeks or something? But you're with the Lions in Abu Dhabi as well for a camp uh, in November. And I reckon, how many young spinners did you have with you there? Carson, Bashir, De Caris, Parkinson, Hartley, Ahmed and Cole. So seven or eight young spinners. A $64 million question. Obviously, is De Caris any good? <laughs> I tell you what, De Caris is possibly my favourite of all the cricketers out there. <laughs> Not only because he looks so much like Michael Atherton, <laughs> I had to call him Atherton the whole way through the trip. But he also did one of the greatest debutant karaoke's I've heard um, on the last night. I'm sure he's told you all about it. Um, I do know, where's this child come from, though, who can bowl very, very tidy off spin and also whacked it when he bats. I mean, he's surely not yours. Actually. If he didn't look exactly like you when he smiles, I'd, did, I'd start what... questioning his DNA. But he had a great camp and he's a great lad. I wouldn't worry too much about your future. He's going to earn a lot of money in cricket and look after you in old age. So, What did Josh have to say about Graham Swan, the coach, and Andrew Flintoff, of course? I mean, I, you know, he's surrounded by all these people I played with and I, I felt sorry for him in that regard. He had a great trip. Loved the people that he worked with. Thought it was uh, an absolutely fantastic experience, but clearly can't be impressed by that much because he's the only spinner <laughs> who hasn't made either of, the, either of the trips after Christmas. But on a more serious note, I mean, you, you, these are the, you know, obviously spin in England is struggling a little bit. You know, you've got Shoei Bashir, who's gone on the main tour. I think he's got, what, 10 first-class wickets at, at 67. But this was an opportunity to look at some up-and-coming spinners, some bright up-and-coming spinners. What, what what did you make of that bunch more generally? I, I tell you, the main thing I made about it was just what an opportunity these lads have got in front of them <clears> because they've played so little cricket. They've got so few overs um, under their belt, a lot of them. I mean, even um, the most experienced of the guys, sort of Carson and Parkinson, who were there, they've barely got sort of 50, 100 wickets between them in first-class cricket. They've not got the whole um, sort of years' worth of experience that spinners used to have or used to be a prerequisite of getting in the England team. You have to have done it for years and years. But such is the game and such is the state of English spin over the last few years that they've just not got it. So... I'm so jealous in, in many ways of them for the opportunities that are in front of them. But I think it is a very modern sort of situation they find themselves in because many of the batsmen they'll come up against haven't got the sort of years and years of, of old first-class pedigree that um, the players of your generation used to have. There used to be so much competition for places and so much more emphasis on the long form of the game uh, that isn't there anymore. So it's, you know, it, it, they're a product of their age. Um, they're all brilliant with the white ball, but they've just not got the nous. They've not got the sort of experience. Um, was the... your role as a coach then technical? Because these lads are right at the start of their journey and presumably, you know, not the finished article technically. Or, in, or was it more in terms of situational play, situations they find themselves in, again, because of that lack of experience? Or is it both? Is it just the whole package you're trying to, to help with? Well, it was a bit of both, but luckily, I mean, they've got to the same. They're all good enough to bowl at test level, put it that way. They've all got the tools required. Each and every cricketer on that trip has the tools. So my, my aim, basically, as I see it, is, is a lot on the mental side. A lot of convincing these lads how good they already are um, and what they don't need to worry about moving forward. Because I know even a brash, cocky little upstart like me, at, at nineteen twenty, I was absolutely shaking like a big leaf deep down that I'd actually be picked to play because I knew I wasn't or thought I was never good enough to play test cricket at that point. It didn't help that there was a monster, a skipper, <laughs> um, who'd scream at you for getting the drinks order wrong at <laughs> half time or whatever. Um, but so, so it's very much sort of a situational thing, if you say, trying to talk them into, give, the, give them some nows um, and try and give them some experience that they've, not had the chance to build up yet. Uh, they can bowl, put it that way. And and the, the guys who are on that trip in India, conditions suit and they get the chance and they can handle the pressure of it, um, are genuinely exciting. Hartley and Bashir could be genuinely exciting on the sort of wickets that are going to be produced by India or what we think are going to be produced. 
um, they've been picked very much for, for that purpose. Um, and, and and they can be brilliant. We saw things in, in Abu Dhabi that genuinely had me grinning like a Cheshire cat and, and, and I'm very excited. And they're complete unknowns to the rest of the world. So should they get the chance um, on, say, the sort of pitch that we played India on last time in Ahmedabad, they could easily roll through any batting lineup in the world. So I think it's very exciting. I, I tried to basically say to them, look, um, try to make them feel like I did when I eventually ended up playing, when I was so not bothered about it by then, because I just thought I'm only getting one or two games. I'm 28 now, and I'm just going to enjoy this. Um, I was very lucky in the way my career went, and I'm trying to get them in the same mental sort of space that I was in then. You said earlier, such is the state of England spin and English spin. Where do you think English spin is at? I'm talking about, you know, I saw a, a graph, Benedict loves a graph, of just the diminishing returns from county cricket, domestic cricket, of an, our era going back before our era and spin and the amount of overs that were been bowled to recently. What is the state of English spin in domestic cricket? And if you were in charge, what would you have done differently, as in with pitches or, um, you know, what would you do different to help spin? Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd try and change the entire narrative um, that's been going on for 15 years now. I get so sick and tired of reading about it's because of the time of year we play, it's because of the pitches we play on, it's because this time of the year is taken by one-day cricket. I think until we switch that, and, and, and as spin bowlers, as a young spinner, if you're starting the season and you know that you're not expected to bowl, you're not expected to take, to take wickets, there's no onus on you to become a good enough bowler to demand a place in the team in April and in, in May. That was never the case when I started. You still had to earn your place and be a wicket-taking bowler. Should a game go four days in April and May, you'd still bowl 25 overs from one end and be expected to win the game for your county when I first played. That's, I think we need to get back that. Stop making excuses and say we play at the wrong time of the year and start flipping that and saying, right, Let's find a way of making you a test player in April, May. Um, September's a, a different one because that's a great time for ball spin, but especially those early season overs. And that also, you know, it doesn't help that you've got captains and coaches who would happily have a green seamer that goes all over the place. But you've still got to find a way of bowling, being useful to your skipper in those months. I think when we do that, we'll be a lot closer to unearthing test bowlers because... First innings in Test cricket, most of the places in the world, the wickets are so flat, it's ridiculous anyway. So you have to find a way of being useful to your team. If you've never had to do it in England, you'll never, you won't know how to do it um, once you play a Test match. So I think we need to to flip the narrative. That's my personal view. Um, and then it, it, the captaincy and the coaching of these of these young guys, because they've not have the chance to develop their game and be useful in those times of the year. They're used to sort of overrate bowlers just to, to get you through till T or bowl the odd over to try and surprise the batsman. They're not used as absolute weapons. So um, the whole game needs to look at itself. We do need match winning spinners. And the only way to do it, if, you know, if, if a pitch turned in April and May, it'd probably get dot points. That has to change. Um, and we'd be better players to spin as well. If, you know, if we play on more, um, spin friendly conditions all year round uh, and with better spinners because they're given more more responsibility. We are products of our environment, aren't we? And I found it fascinating a couple of years ago we had you at Trent Bridge at the cart speaking to Ath about how it helped you so much going from Wantage Road, North Ants, where you learnt your trade with Monty on some bare yeah. end pitches that you and Monty had been scrubbing overnight to get them turning to move <laughs> to Trent Bridge you felt actually made you a better bowler, almost because you could deceive the batter before it landed and was more like what you'd expect in a test match and what you needed in a test match. Absolutely. Um, I, when I left Northamptonshire, I mean, I would never have left Northampton had my um, relationship with Kepler Vessels not been so horrifically toxic by the end. But I went and I had the chance... To, you ever thought you might language. be the common denominator in all these problems, Swanee? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I see South African coaches as my common denominator. That I don't get on with. Well, South African it's like the players, KP you know. doco all over again. I know. Um, 
Just imagine, just going back to what you said earlier, by the way, as an aside, Athens, with South Africa sending their third team, do you think we're in a situation now where young English players might be moving to South Africa <laughs> to play test cricket? Like, it did a complete role reversal. Um, um, but no, I... when I did go uh, to Trent Bridge, one of the main reasons, it, it was, it came down between Lancashire or Nottinghamshire, who I was going to go to, and it was all down to Mick Newell um, making me feel valued and wanted and saying I want to win the county championship I don't I do not want to just see how good we are next year I want to put together a team to win the county championship and you're the spinner I want to do it whereas uh, at Lancashire Mike Watkinson said well we've got Murray Lutheran coming back and Keeds had a good year last year Gary Keeley so you might not be in the red ball team but you'll probably play the one day um and yet, you'd, you'd have had more fun and, with us <laughs> yeah, but money-wise and pitch-wise, Old Trafford was sort of the obvious place to go. Um, but I, I, I just thought, you know, I want to win the county championship. So I went to a place I knew was very hard to boss spin, and it made me at 10 times the bowl within a season. A, having Chris Reed as the keeper, who was the best keeper in England and was brilliant to work with. Um and B, yeah, I had to put more on the ball. I had to be more canny, more wily, work people out and make myself useful for half a season where, you know, it was swinging around corners those days. So if I hadn't been good enough, I wouldn't have got any cricket. Um, I-, I wanted to, in a moment, m- move on to your memories of 2012-13 because you're part of the team that last won a series in India, amazingly, ago, a, a decade ago. Um, but before we do, just to go back to the lads you're with at the Lions and who are now with the England main team, two yep. of the relatively unheard of spinners, Shoei Bashi, who we touched on, Somerset, young Somerset off spinner, and Tom Hartley, the left arm spinner. Just give us a kind of insight into both those. It, it seems to me that the selectors have decided that they want tall bowlers who can, they're assuming the pitches will spin, they want tall bowlers who can fire the ball into the surface. I, I saw in a, an interview with the Mail that you, you did in the last couple of days, you're talking about the size of Bashir's fingers, for example. He's got huge long fingers. He can clearly give it a rip. Uh, and Tom Hartley, you know, fires it down at a decent lick. Just give us a bit of an insight into those two in particular. Yeah, I, I think, you know, since I've been working with England over the last couple of years, and Keezy especially, um, has basically said, look, we need to do, looking forward to the pitches we're going to get in India, we need to pick bowlers who are going to be effective on those pitches. And they looked at what Aksha Patel did uh, for India. A very tall man, doesn't put a great deal on it, but very accurate and hits a length that's been doctored basically to, to really turn. And I've got no issue with that, by the way, just before I lose any friends in India. Um, <laughs> and, and, and these guys are very similar. Hartley is a very tall, very tall lad. I mean, he's 6'4", he's easy. He towers over me and I'm a strapping six-footer. Um, and then Bashir, like I said, has the biggest hands. I, I think all this talk of aliens and UFOs these days, I think Bashir may be one because his hands are freakishly big. He's got longer fingers than Monty Panasar. I mean, he's, these boys are so tall and they bowl from such a height. that They don't have to put a great deal of energy, a, a great deal of air on the ball. It comes down with, with decent rotation on it. Um, and if they can land it in the right area, they're both fairly consistent, they can be a right handful. I, uh, watching them both bowl in conditions that are favourable, they could be a real handful. Um, it, it, it's all, it, 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 obviously, it's, it's gambling a bit because the guys have got so little red ball experience. Yeah. But when you look at the options on offer and the guys who could have gone, you I have mean, to I guess gamble that's the question about Bashir in particular, isn't it? I mean, I mentioned his figures earlier. I think 10 first-class wickets at 67 or, or something, I mean, you know, obviously he's at the start of his journey. They, they can see a high ceiling there. It's all to come for him. But nevertheless, it's still a, it's going to ask a lot of a, of a young cricketer like that, isn't it? I mean, other than Rayan Ahmed, who was picked, you know, having played just three games, I think, before he went to Pakistan last year. But that, in a way, that's because of the rarity of leg spin in England. It's hard yeah. to think of another off spinner, certainly in my lifetime, Nas, that... England have taken such a punt on at such an early stage. Oh, absolutely. Um, and to be fair to him, I mean, sure, Bash bowled himself onto this trip. Yes. Um, probably before Abu Dhabi, you know, on paper, he would probably be nowhere near the top of that list. Um, but in the 
and he missed the first week as well because it split webbing on his finger. So he didn't have as much um, opportunity to sort of showcase his talent. He bowled amazingly, he bowled brilliantly. We had a three day game against an Afghanistan team who came over and he looked like a test bowler. He, bowled, he was bowling people through the gate. He was consistent. He was, I mean, beating the bat on both edges as well. He bowled brilliantly and he sort of picked himself for the trip. Um, but like you said, it is, I mean, it is, it is a huge pressure on, on these young lads. But whoever got picked was going to end up under that pressure. Um, but I think this sort of regime we have these days with Baz in charge and with Stokes, there couldn't be a better time to be a young, inexperienced player because you're just going to get almost cuddled into the team. There's not the sort of hard nose mentality they used to be. It's not sink or swim. Um, without any armbands. Nowadays, you, you, you're throwing the full rubber ring and armbands and everything, and there's three lifeguards on duty. You, you don't have to flap around like we used to. And I think if there's ever a good time to play with a positive sort of mindset and everything that goes with uh, with Baz McCullum in charge, it's probably the best time to be a young and experienced bowler. I wish, <laughs> if, if I could have my time again, I wish Baz was in charge. Obviously, I wish Nass was captain, but I think it would be different under Baz. But the the other thing you mentioned in that article, and you've just touched on it there, you wish you'd played now under this regime. Everyone talks about Baz ball with the bat, but the attacking nature with the ball as well. Look to get yeah. wickets and not go, you know, not worry about how many runs per over you're going at. The only anomaly with that, and we're going to come on to uh, 2012, you played in the number one side in the world with a coach and a captain who were worried about how many runs you, you know, dry up, bowl maidens, that's how you get wickets as well. So both with bat and ball, that that tour you had, Peterson and Cook, Cook had a fabulous series by yeah. just knocking it around and batting like Alistair Cook, and Peterson was Kevin Peterson. So my point of the question is that there isn't just one way, there are so many different ways of being successful. You can dry up and get wickets like that. You can take the opposition on. You can grind out a score as well. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, when I say that I I'd, I'd wish to have played in this regime, most of it would be from a monetary point of view because because uh, they're absolutely loaded. They've all got Lamborghinis, these boys, <laughs> these days. And I'm still driving a Fiat Punto around. Um, but the, the actual, the, the way that you can still play, especially in India, I think when you watch the the way the Indian top six bat, they're not gung ho. They play Test cricket in, a, in an old fashioned manner. Um, and as a spinner, it's it's ideal that you can go in and you can drive people. And you don't have to worry about being dominated so much. Um, yeah, it, it, it has completely changed. I'm I'm all for the sort of ultra positive mode of cricket. Whether it have suited the England team I played in at the time, I'm not sure it would. We had bowlers. Who didn't want to? Who were miserly? Didn't want to go for runs in their very nature. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I take your point completely. That there are more than one ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Um, I, I think I'd have enjoyed the modern game more for my batting because I think I was a trailblazer. <laughs> honestly, if you'd pick, if you'd pick me all those, years, imagine you could have won an Ashes <laughs> after um, Nats if you'd pick me. But never mind. Um, I, thought, I thought we did pick you as a batter, to be honest. <laughs> um, Swanee, 2012 13, then, which Nas touched on there, 10 years ago, last team to, to win in India. A couple of areas that have come in for criticism is England's preparation. They're, they're, they're not going to go to India until right the last minute before the first test. I think they arrive there four yeah. or five days before the first test, maybe even three. But they're going to do a long warm up prep in Abu Dhabi. You had one warm-up game before that 2012-13 series. And then you went into the first test in Ahmedabad and you bowled 51 overs from... Well, I, I looked it up. You bowled 51 overs uh, in that first test. Um, yeah. So was one warm-up game enough for you in, in, that, uh, in that tour 10 years ago? Is what England are doing now sufficient, given that they're only arriving two or three days before the first test? And 51 overs in, I mean, did you have issues with your spinning finger like Mo had this summer? And did you have any particular remedies to help you through that? Um, I actually didn't even have the warm-up game because my daughter had just been born and she got really poorly. We, we thought she had meningitis, so I was flown home and I didn't even play 
in the uh, in the warm up game. I got home and they realised that she didn't have meningitis, and I was immediately hauled back to India. So I think I landed the day before the test um, with no overs under my belt whatsoever, which is the time where you normally get finger problems. Um, but so, I, I can't remember having any issues at all then. The the only ball that used to really ruin my hand would be a Duke's ball early in the English season. If it got wet and that had meant cause a huge blister on my hand that would then bleed every time I bowled it, it would split the wound back open. When Mo played last year, I saw his finger when this when your cameras zoomed in on him. Yeah. And it sort of brought back a, an old sort of aching feeling. Uh, <laughs> That spinners get when when it, he he had that blister that just ripped the skin off and it wasn't bloody but it was red raw and sore and you know it's not gonna it's not gonna fix itself. I mean there are various ailments. You, you know, put a bit of plaster on it. I always say put a bit of elastic plaster on. If the umpire says take that off, then you just take it off. If it's not the actual finger that spins the ball, if it's the other finger, I think you can argue. Um, well, with, with the Australians using sandpaper on the ball, I think we should be allowed to put a plaster on our fingers. Um, and uh, but no, I, I, I know you're probably trying to get out. I, I did an interview when I was about eighteen, and I'd been told that you could wee on your hands to toughen up your fingers. That was Nick Cook, who was my county coach. Um, so when I first got picked for England, I, I walked into a press conference thinking no one will be here, and there were about fifty journalists and all these cameras. I made the front page of the Sun. It just said, "Are you taking the piss?" <laughs> and um, and uh, and and Mr. Hussain was asked about it. He said, "Well, I'm not shaking hands with him." <laughs> um, and I'd, I'd not even met Nas at that point. I thought I may have uh, made a bit of a mistake here doing this interview. But happy days. But on a serious point, once it goes, you're you're, you're knacking a little bit until it until it heals over. So, um, I mean, you'd been to India before, hadn't you? You played a couple of tests in 2008. Yeah. With only modest success, I suppose. But I, I look back at your record. You'd taken six wickets against India in the previous test before that 2012-13 tour. You took six at the Oval against them. I, I think how how important was that in giving you the confidence that you had the ability to bowl spin at a bunch of players who, by reputation, are, are the best players of spin going around? Yeah, um Absolutely, you actually doing it and getting people out. I mean, when you say with, with a modicum of success, I think that's quite a generous way of saying it. I, I, my first test match, after getting two wickets in my first over, um, I was the spinner mainly responsible for us not being able to defend 380 um, at Chennai because yeah. this little fella called Tendulkar decided that he was going to bat like the god that he was um, and made us all look stupid. I must say that that was under Kevin's captaincy, so I didn't have complete control over my field. And <laughs> had I had that, he would never have got those runs, obviously. Um, but yeah, once you've bowled at these people and got them out, it makes you realise that test... I mean, my first over in test cricket was the greatest over for me uh, that could have happened because I'd played against Raul Dravid in a county game either six months or a year before. And he had made me feel like an 11-year-old, an imposter. Because he was so good, he was so dominant, um, and without trying to you know, ever physically get on top of you, he just made a mockery of every field I set and wherever I bowled it, whatever I came up with, he was five moves ahead. But when he walked out to bat in Chen in Chennai, and it was after the Mumbai terrorist attacks, so there was a huge sort of global focus on this game, and you could feel the like the entire. Indian public stopping work just because the wall was walking out to bat and I I'd got Gambier out with my third ball when he padded up to one and I just watched him walk past me with like eyes like dustbin lids he looked absolutely petrified and I stood there and he got out second ball to me LB with a ball that should never have got him out would never have got him out in that county game uh, before and I just remember thinking that was he, he didn't play me at all he didn't play the ball that was coming down he played the occasion and that made me realise from that point on that test, the secret to test cricket was to try and treat it as if you are the best player in the world and everyone else has to dance to your tune, as if you're playing a club game and you're the superstar and you're guaranteed to take wickets. That took all the pressure off me from that point on. Of course, it doesn't always go your way. In the second innings of that game, certainly didn't go my way. But that was the biggest thing for me, knowing that you can get these players out at this level 
without having to bowl this miracle ball that you don't think you're capable of was, was a major thing for me. Going back to that uh, successful tour, 2012, and specifically from the first test where you got beaten and beaten comfortably to the second test in Mumbai, what are your memories? And the narrative has been that they prepared the turning pitch and made it turn too much, and that brought you and Panasar well into the game. Do you agree with that? No, I don't at all, because I actually remember playing in that game. What I will say <laughs> is that the Wankini Stadium in Mumbai and the pitch, the red soil pitch, is the best test pitch I've ever played on. It was incredible. The first two and a half, three days, that thing was as flat as the day is long. It barely turned. It was incredible for batting on. The, Wank <laughs> the Wankini is very small as well. And so, and it's a glorious outfield. Pajara got 150 on. India got quite a lot of runs in their first innings. And then Cookie sort of ground out a big 100. Kev went out and played one of his best ever knocks for England, I think. Far better than the 100 he got against South Africa at Leeds years before in the situation. I think the one in Mumbai was incredible. We scored so many runs that the, the wicket had naturally broken up. And by the time we bowled it again, sort of end of day three, day four, it was absolutely ragging square, but also bouncing. It's like a trampoline. It was incredible to bowl on. And Monty bowled like a dream. I, I didn't, I look back in that test. I mean, I bowled fairly well from the other end. I got Virat Kohli out with a filthy full toss, which is, is took, took him by surprise. And he hit it straight to Stephen Finn at mid off to be caught. But I didn't, ever feel like I was doing anything special. I was almost just supporting Monty at the other end because he, he was bowling sort of 65 miles an hour, pitching middle and leg, fizzing past the outside edge or taking the shoulder of the bat. He was incredible in that game. It's, it's the best wicket I've ever played on. It, but it, it wasn't anywhere near the pitches like they played in the last tour in Amderbad that were turning ridiculous amounts sort of on day one. So, yeah, I stand by my performance, basically. And that's, it wasn't that easy. 19 wickets you shared, uh, yourself and, and Monty. Just talk to us a little bit about the importance of partnership for spinners, bowling in partnerships, when you get over to India, when you're doing a, a, a lot of the bowling yourselves. Clearly, Jack Leach is going to have to partner with somebody if we're playing on similar pitches again. Just talk to us a little bit about yourself and Monty. Two very different characters, obviously, but... A, did you enjoy bowling with him? What kind of, you know, interactions did you have during that game? You know, I adored playing with Monty, but I definitely felt like the very senior partner in, in that sort of relationship. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's because I was a better bowler than him, but I certainly thought about the game more than Monty. And I, always, I was always given um, sort of free reign, by, especially by Cookie and by Straussy before him, to set my own fields to tell them how I was going to bowl. And then I was given, I was like the conductor of an orchestra. I was allowed to set my fields and I was trusted to do that. I remember in that test when Indy were seven or eight down in the second innings, we were obviously going to win. And Andy uh, Flower had said to us at tea time, right, when you go back out, let Monty set his own fields. We're going to try and develop that side of his game. Because I'd go up to him every over and say, what do you reckon, Mon? And he'd just have this sort of, demented grin on his face um, when you thought that I don't know what's going on behind those eyes he's certainly not thinking about cricket and then he just run up and bowl six jaffers at Sachin Tendulkar it was it was wonderfully simple cricket for a month but we said right we're going to let him set his own fields and let him fit and just sort of see how he's thinking about the game and he immediately packed the leg side with about seven fielders when he was turning it to right handers <laughs> He had no one on the offside. He got hit for a few falls. And I saw Andy on the balcony shaking his head and Cookie going, well, that hasn't worked. Right, Mon, just want to do your field again. <laughs> so it was, I love playing with Monty. He is, I'll, I'll always say he's got like a childlike innocence about him. Um, and just this love for cricket that is amazing. And, and saw him in, in good stead. But I, I think Monty was always better when he had someone at the other end. Uh, me, basically doing sort of the heavy lifting and letting him not worry about anything, just running up and bowling. And I'd say, to, I'd, every time I'd bowl, I'd just stand there and I'd say, mate, I wish I could bowl like you. Look at your action. Look at the shape you get on the ball. Look how consistent you are. This is, this is my treat. And he'd just grin like a kid at Christmas. Um, and he, he bowled, and that's, that's the best he bowled for England by miles. 
in, in that series. He didn't even play in the first test, and yet he still got 17 wickets. He was brilliant in that series. You mentioned Virat Kohli there, who's right at the start of his test career. You, you, you said you got him out with a full bonger in, in Mumbai. Did you have a sense in that series at all that you were witnessing someone who's going to be a special player? I did. Um, not so much in that series, but in the one-day series we played, um, I think maybe the year before, he got 100 against us in Delhi. And we'd been told beforehand, like, do not say anything to this bloke. He really does revel in, in a battle on the field. He loves chasing down titles and he's a big fighter on the pitch. And so we all went out there sort of just ignoring And he does look for it. He's Brit. I love it. He does look for it. And he's always got that grin, sort of that sort of very stern face, sorry. And he's always looking, sort of checking to see if anyone's staring back at him. And Stephen Finn had just, he got driven for a couple of incredible falls. And he just lost the plot and had a go at him. And, and he, you saw him, he, he sort of realised his mistake straight away because Vera sort of roared up like a unleashed tiger and Finney just doubled down and went really really hard <laughs> and then got smashed everywhere and he got this hundred and so we knew what Vera could do in the white ball but he hadn't really done anything in test cricket I got him out in the first test actually and there was the, he had one technical thing that I loved about Vera when I bowled at him that his front foot went very straight down the wicket he didn't really go towards the off stump and so I knew if I could get it to drift and, and bite and turn, I could get him through the gate. Well, that's how I always felt I could get Vera out. It didn't often work. You had to bowl sort of the perfect ball. Um, but he was very different to some of the other players in that regard. The one I didn't but like bowling at all was Pujara because he was very nimble on his feet. It's strange when I look back, look at their team. They had Laxman, Saywag, Tendulkar, um, and Kohli. And yet the one I didn't like bowling at was Pujara. What about throwing it ahead to the tour that's coming up, Graham? An expectation of those three young spinners. Jack Leach has been around, but the three younger spinners, we played with spinners that were always compared to the opposition. So you'd see Tuffers' face when Shane Warne was pitching it leg and hitting off. You'd see Crofty's face when Murley was bowling it a yard outside off and going past the leg stump. You're coming up against two or three great you know, if not all-time great spinners, especially in Ravi Ashwin, which I know you've got a huge admiration for as a fellow off-spinner. It is very difficult as a young spinner when you see them going through their magic yeah. in the opposition and everyone's looking at you saying, can you do the same? So it's managing expectation and realising where they are with their game at the moment. I think you're absolutely right. That's probably the biggest thing for any of these lads, whoever plays, and especially Jack. I think that's something that's, sort of hung around Jack for his whole career is he's forever looking at the other spinner and he's not the sort of brash, confident, bullish type who just go out there saying, I don't care, I'm I'm brilliant, I'll be fine. You naturally always look at the other spinner on the other side that what we have to do and, and what um the England the full England side has to do is try and just get them to ignore it completely. You cannot control what they're doing. You can't control other people's expectations. All you can do is is what when you've got the ball in your hand, is run up and put the ball in the right place. I always think one of the greatest things I did was not have to play with Warney in the same game. <laughs> I, Warney was always commentating by the time I was bowling, so I could go and talk to him before the game and ask him what I should do. But Warney was brilliant. You know, I don't know if I've ever said this about um, his method, what he said to me fairly early on when I was playing for England. And I said to him, I'll... You know, how did you, you know, those last couple of days in the Test match? Because I always loved the first three days of a Test match. I felt like, honestly, like I was playing a village cricket game or a Sunday afternoon game with the church bells ringing because there was no pressure on me. I batted down the order. I bowled. I had to keep it tight, but I wasn't expected to take wickets. And so I never felt any pressure. All the pressure for me came on days three, four and five when suddenly we're in a good position. You're expected to win the game. And that's when naturally people look to you and your expectation is, I hope I don't let them down. And I spoke to Warney and he just said, mate, you never think like that. I'm not going to do the Aussie accent. Um, he said, never think like that. In the first innings, try and spin the ball as hard as you can because the pitch will do nothing. Try and pick up the odd wicket here. And in the second inning, rather than worry about it, just go, the pitch is doing everything for me now and just land it where you can. So take the pressure off yourself he'd like always, that. And it was the best advice I ever had. wouldn't he, I think? when it's in your favour, bowl defensively with an attacking field and keep it simple. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And he just said, like, the pitch will do most of the work for you in the second innings. All you've got to do. And, and, and he, you know, he created such amazing drama and sort of pantomime almost with his body language, with his chirping and everything. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that anyone should try and copy that, but everyone should try and look as confident as Shane Warne did in the second innings of any game. If you can bluff the batsman into thinking you're in control and you know what you're doing, that's 50% of the battle in, in test cricket. Um, and if the pitches are doing a lot, like they will do in India, I think like Jack could be a world-beating spinner because he's so accurate. He could easily get similar figures to Jadeja and, and similar wickets in India because he doesn't do anything different to Jadeja. He pitches it in the same place every time and he turns it away from the bat. So there's no reason... Um, why they can't do it. It's getting them to believe that. That's the tricky bit. Um, just before we let you go, just tell us uh, a bit about the next couple of weeks then with the Lions, how many games you got, where you're going to be. And for you yourself, your aspirations. I, I mean, you're doing a bit of everything these days, but in the commentary box, a yeah. bit of coaching, uh, watching Newcastle a bit. I, I mean, what ambitions <laughs> do you have as a, as a coach going forward? Well, for the next few weeks, we're... In Ahmedabad for the entire we've got three games against India A, all at the Mahendra Modi Stadium. So the stadium that holds 130,000. <laughs> but we were there today, and it's that's phenomenal for these for these kids to turn up and, and know that they're playing at where the World Cup final was not long ago. An incredible stadium. Um, me personally, I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna try and get these boys into the stage where if they get picked for England they can just walk into the test team and be the best version of themselves they can in a month. Um, and when this finishes, we sort of overlap slightly with the main tour. I mean, deep down, the, 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 the little boy at Christmas inside me is hoping that England go, you know what, why don't you stay on and help us spin it here a bit? That would be the dream. Um, because, yeah, I, I am doing a bit of everything at the minute. I've, I've been doing com commentary for like 10 years now. And I'm a bit like Keezy. You know, when Keezy got the job and he said, at the end of the day, when you commentate, you say what you want, but it doesn't actually make any difference. So um, it actually, I, I did start getting very itchy feet thinking I need to be involved. I need to actually, it sounds really terrible, but sort of give something back and try and help spinners out. That's why I started coaching for the Trent Rockets. And I loved it. From the second I started, the second I was back within a team environment, I absolutely loved it. Um, it was all the good bits that I could remember, none of the bad stuff, um, mainly because all the characters have changed so much and there was no grumpy captain at the front of the bus <laughs> making me sit at the back and turning my music off. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, moving forward, I, I, the way the coaching is going at the minute, I'd do this every day, if you ask me. Just so, one day, if, if De Keras gets in the England team <laughs> and if Nasser is saying... Ever gets, I don't know. I think NASA could end up being head of cricket or something. <laughs> I'm cat, I'm head of English cricket, and I can just sit there with NASA and we can have a nice cup of tea. That would be the dream. And me. heaven forbid you are head of English cricket and you are in that, <laughs> in that huddle that first morning in Hyderabad. What would be your one, as someone who's won in India, what would be yep. your final words to the 11 that took the field in India? What would be your advice, Graham? I would honestly say, I'd say the easiest thing to be in India is intimidated, all right? How good do you think the Indian batsmen are against spin? How good do you think the Indians are at cricket? How big the game is over here? Because it is enormous, let's face it. And it's not. We are no, or these young lads are nowhere near as far behind, talent-wise, than the, their Indian counterparts. And I'd try and ram that home. If they truly believe they're good enough to beat these Indian A players and go on and play test cricket, beat the Indian test players in a month's time, they can do it. That is the message I would ram home um, because that's what I firmly believe. Well, it's great to catch up with you again. Good luck with the Lions in Ahmedabad over the next few weeks. Let's hope the dream of joining the main team comes true as well at the beginning of, what, end of January, beginning of February. Um, I hope the trip for you is, is really successful. Thanks for joining us, mate. Great, great to catch up again. Thanks for your time, Swanee. Thanks, boys. Thanks, Nas. See you soon. Give us a call, Nas. <laughs> big big we'll buddy. Golf. <laughs> <laughs> Nats, I mean, England's best spinner there of the modern times. How did you see him in 99 and then not 
you know, just has he gone? You has sent he, him to the wilderness. Has he switched off? For about nine years. I can still see him on my screen. I think in my book. I called <laughs> Did I, him. Shall I go? No. <laughs> I think I called I'll, him the schoolboy hospital. I'm going to turn this off so you, so you can get a better podcast. Honest. And I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. It sounds it. When I look back at it now, what I meant was we could all see something there. He was a really attacking off spinner. He almost bowled like an Australian line, but he just didn't have the control back then. People have made quite a big deal out of Swan, the character. I didn't mind. As you know, if you were in the dressing room, we loved characters. We, we had the Goffs, the Headleys, we had them all. And that, that's part of being a captain, is dealing with people like Graham Swan. I love that side of leadership. It didn't bother me. I think Headley had to, at one stage, drag him to one side, uh, Centurion or something like that, to have a word with him. That has been overplayed. I didn't mind Swanee, the character. I just didn't see him as the finished article. He'd obviously been selected on raw talent, and we could see that. But at that stage, we just wanted a spinner to hold an end up for Goff or Caddick or whatever, and he didn't quite have that control. Um, and I think that's why, in the end, it, it made it quite good for him to progress as a cricketer, to move from North Ants, where you could just sort of bowl ball after ball to try and find different things, a little bit like Jack Leach. Jack Leach's problem has been slightly, as Shane said about Monty Panesar, he hasn't played 33 different test matches. He's played the same test 33 times. So I think the progression by the next time we saw Graham Swan, he had nearly become the finished article. Final question before we go. Um, I, I was bombarded on Twitter the other day by somebody showing me footage of you <laughs> playing for England under 19 yeah. at the Adelaide Oval, 1980. Serious player. What, I mean, what happened? You had some shots then. I know. That's why, I'm get, that's why I said my New Year's resolution, I'm going to get in the gym and build the guns up. They've obviously completely disappeared. I had sub back like Viv Richards. Seriously, offside, leg side. I showed Joel that yeah, last night on the sofa. Have you seen me back here? Went, that ain't you. I didn't have a lid on or anything. And it was against Australia. What a player I was. Well, I'd encourage you to catch up with that if you can on Twitter. Uh, footage of NASA batting in 1988 as a young 19-year-old. He could play. All right, we'll see you next week.